every industry is finding a need and a way to apply these it's for helping with safety or investigation or engineering or construction. You're representing something from real life. You're capturing existing reality. In 2004-ish, I saw VDC, Virtual Design and Construction. It was just a, t a turning point for me. I, I saw it and I was like, that, I need to do that. I think we'll see a heightened awareness around the importance of survey and control. Well, if I put enough information into this model, we can get a whole bunch out of it. Like that becomes our plan. Do NFTs start to influence the way that we do contracts? Can we use this technology to make the job site just as safe as the office? The concept of blockchain and having a public ledger, like I could see that being very valuable on a project, but there's like a cultural shift and a mindset shift that everybody's gonna have to have. That's, that's what's really exciting about like where things are at right now is that we're really starting to mature in what we can do with the information and you started to see different perspectives of how to solve our problems. All right, welcome to the Reality Capture Network. Today, we're excited to have Josh with us from DPR. So welcome, Josh. Honored to be here. So, you know, normally we like to start these by digging into the background of our guest a little bit so people get to know you, um, you know, really before we get to the technology piece. So would love to just spend a few minutes talking about you and your background, you know, where you grew up and, and we'll kind of get to the journey of, of getting into the industry. Yeah, it's kind of a long story. So I'll try to, I'll try to summarize. Um, I've been in the industry for 21 years now. A little while. Um, so yeah, it's crazy to say that at this point, I feel too young <laughs> to yeah. be able to say that. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I kind of fell into it. I, I was really interested in, in school at, uh, in CAD and, and computer aided drafting. Um, and I always had a fascination for technology. Mm. Like my dad was more or less like handyman builder kind of guy. Um, my mom was a teacher and my grandfather was really into, um, technology mm. and I got exposed to like really early versions of Windows and things like that and used to play old like games on their DOS computer and all with this kind of stuff. With the big discs? With the big oh, square? Oh yeah, the big floppy discs <laughs> and the whole deal. And you know, some of that was even old back then. Yeah. Um, but just the idea of technology and like what it could do for, uh, you know, business and industry and like all that kind of stuff. I wasn't really there, you know, obviously when I was, when I was a kid, but, um, then, you know, I had, a, I also had a passion for drawing. So like those two things kind of collided with AutoCAD, yeah. like learning AutoCAD in, in, in high school. And I just kind of took to that. Um, and, uh, I ended up not going to, to college. I went for a little while. Um, and I just, at the time, I just really didn't know what I was going for. Mm -hmm. um, that I, sounds normal. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, and it was just a weird time. It was like 20, or 2001. Um, I was in school when 9-11 happened. Mm. And so there was a lot, you know, everybody's questioning what they were, what they were doing at that point. Not unlike uh, the great resignation that's happening right now. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I just kind of uh, decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I had a couple other, you know, odd jobs here and there. Like I've had some really weird jobs. Like I was, yeah. a, I was a machinist, like apprentice for a little while. I chained, like cleaned machines and, you know, did, uh, did that for a little bit. Um, I worked at like plastic injection mold shops. So okay. I got some really interesting like uh, exposure there to some, CAD cam stuff and, yeah. you know, precision machining and, um, stuff like that. I worked at a drill bit manufacturing company, mm -hmm. um, in the engineer engineering department. And it was kind of interesting. Like we made drill bits from steel. You yeah. Know? I never really knew how to build a drill bit. Yeah. So I had to learn how those were made and then tell people how to make them based on what order we were getting and who it was for and all this kind of stuff. And, it was, it was a really interesting gig um, in, in some aspects, and I was trying to bring it to CAD. Okay. Like, like we were literally copying and pasting 
plans. Oh, wow. And I was like, I can do this all on yeah. CAD and we can have like really, you know, nice drawings and all this kind of stuff. And when I was working there, I kind of fell into construction in a way. Like um, I, I, I met a guy that ended up hiring me at what's now uh, Lend Lease. Yep. And, um, you know, it was just kind of one of those things where we, we, we met by, by chance. He needed somebody on a project that, you know, he could – that, that kind of knew how to build stuff that could sort of like, you know, um, be part of the team. It was a really small team yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was out in Blythe. And oh, Blythe. Yeah. yeah. So they were <laughs> like, Hey, we need, we need somebody to go out to this project. And you know, it was, it was kind of a crazy situation, like new job, drive out to, you know, three, four hours away in the middle of week, nowhere, stay there and just like, yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I ended up doing projects like that for like four years. Okay. Um, where I would like stay with somebody that was coming out of state and mm-hmm. you know, we would kind of get teamed up on these, on these projects. So I was like a project engineer for like yeah. four years and that kind of got me a taste of what the industry was like right before the digital transformation. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, right. So, so like that first project, we were faxing RFIs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I look back on it now oh, and I'm man. like, it's so bizarre, you know, yeah. um, to like be faxing and, you know, um, seeing the in introduction of blackberries and stuff like that. <laughs> and like, wait, what's faxing again? <laughs> exactly. <No. laughs> it's like, no. you know, it's just, you, I, yeah. I, I do talk to people about it every once in a while and they're like, what's, what's that? It's yeah. Like, oh, well, you know, it's before we had really e- email, but you know, so it's kind of cool that I, I kind of had that foundation where I got to see like yep. what the way that we did it before, um, you know, before we had email, before we had, you know, IMs and zooms and mm-hmm. all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but I've always been interested in, you know, changing that, like I, the, the, the next, I always fantasize about what, what does it look like next? Yeah. You know, um, and, uh, you know, I kind of got to be part of that. So, like, in 2004-ish, I saw my first introduction to VDC, Virtual Design and Construction. And um, I can remember where I was, where I was sitting, what it looks like. Yep. You know, what I was looking at. Um, I remember how they described it, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it was it was just a, t- a turning point for me. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. I, I saw it and I was like, that I need to do that, and um, that that sparked a, <laughs> a journey that uh, really you know is 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 probably never going to end. But yeah, um, I spent you know f- fourteen fifteen years in. Uh, in in VDC, yeah, right, because of that to, that moment. To my knowledge, um, you know, and I'm not from the construction side, but obviously we all are familiar with the term now of VDC and BIM and digital, t- you know, mm-hmm. all of that. But uh, 2004 sounds pretty early for the term early. VDC. It wasn't called that. No. Okay. It was, it was what I was watching was what we would call now like a 4D construction sequence. Okay. You know, but it was kind of starting what what we call VDC now. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, but that was that was the early stages of it. It was very much Hollywood BIM, like yeah. show the logistics. Yeah. And, but I just never had seen that before. I'd never yeah. seen a, a, a construction job be animated to the point where you could really understand, mm-hmm. you know, the sequence of work and like you could see like oh they're they're building these things on the slab and then they're lifting them up. You know, like yeah. that kind of communication of what you know was planned for the for the job like that just didn't exist and yeah. i wanted to figure out i wanted to be the guy that did that mm-hmm. you know like i was like i want to i want to figure out how that's done i you didn't want to be the guy faxing the papers no i didn't want to be the guy <laughs> faxing the papers anymore um and so i was I, I was really interested in that and um you know trying to get trained on that at the same time i was still a, a pe and um i've <laughs> now you know, kind of like I, I, I do rock the boat every now and then. And I was rocking the boat then because I wanted as a PE, I wanted to learn the whole process. Yeah. 
And now it's like normal for PEs to focus on the trade mm -hmm. and like go start to finish with the trade. It's like, you know, we do that all the time. And I wanted to do that back then. I was like, you know, I yeah. just, I, I had just spent a lot of time in pre-con, like tallying up the bids for a couple different scopes. I was like, I know these scopes really well. Um, and uh, anyway, we couldn't get aligned on, on that. So mm -hmm. I ended up leaving uh, that company for one that was going after more VDC stuff. Um, so I left, I left Lendlease. I went to WM Corman, which is a, a, a great company. They were doing a lot of uh, concrete at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I just, I did, I didn't get into that side of it okay. there. And, um, so I ended up jumping ship and going to Swinerton. I ended up there for five years. Yeah. Um, and that timing was perfect because right when I started, um, they had just kicked off a VDC initiative. Um, things were coming, like things had come out of SIFI out of Stanford mm -hmm. for a while. They kind of coined the the VDC term and it was starting to become a thing. Yep. Some of the big guys were starting to get into it. Yep. Um, and, you know, I just kind of, I ended up going head first. Like at, at one point I was like, I really want to get into this. Um, they pulled me into the field and, and brought me in and um, we did a lot of cool stuff there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did some model-based estimating like really early on. Mm -hmm. um, we got into you know a lot of the 4d stuff one of my first like projects was doing this logistics plan that was very similar to what i i would have like what i saw in, in 2004 yep. um and i look back on it now and i'm like man that took forever yeah like, to, <laughs> because you know uh there wasn't youtube there wasn't anything uh -huh. to like learn how to do this stuff so yeah. a lot of it was trial and error yeah. And I remember having meetings about like how we were doing stuff and, you know, how we were modeling. And it was a lot of like just figuring out the softwares totally. and, and just teaching ourselves, yeah. you know, kind uh, of thing. On top of the lack of um, education or training on how to do that. I mean, back then too, the software, the workflows, the processes, it was probably way harder and, and laborious than, than it would be today. We talked a lot about interoperability. <laughs> <laughs> and and the interoperability that we have today, we almost take for granted. Yeah, you know. I think we always do that, whatever stage we're in. Yeah, there's for a, sure. you know, <laughs> like oh, we got to integrate. We got to integrate. Enough. It's like yeah. yeah. And and back then it was like we couldn't. We didn't even know if we could bring like Tecla into Navisworks. Yeah, you know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but you know it was really interesting to be in that at that time because we were trying to figure a lot of it out mm -hmm. like it was still kind of like well, what value can we get out of this you know and it just um it just sort of kept going yeah. you know like and eventually you realize well if we if we put enough you know and then and then it started you know we started talking about single source of truth and all this you know concept of like well if i put enough information into this model we can get a whole bunch out of it like that becomes our plan yeah you know, um, so that, that, that became really exciting and, you know, coordination and all that stuff did a, did a ton of that. Um, and then like 10 years ago, uh, almost 10 years ago, um, I, I decided to move to DPR. Yeah. Um, long story short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you've been there um, for a while. Yeah. And I've been, I've been here for, for 10 years. Um, basically all that time has been focused on, on VDC and, I've been really impressed with what we've been able to do in the last four or five years in terms of getting, getting serious about it. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, building up the team and building up our capabilities and, and, and expertise. And, um, it's, it's pretty amazing to see how much, um, everybody's bought in. Yeah. You yeah. know, and they're starting to realize like, yeah, this is, we can, we can put our effort here and get a lot more out of it than yep. we than we ever thought. Yeah, you know. And maybe for the uh, the people listening that don't know DPR well, which I know a lot of people do, could you kind of give us the high level of like, you know, what all do you guys do? Where what areas do you cover? Yeah, we're we're a pretty large commercial contractor at, at this point. Um, when when I joined, we were significantly smaller. I think everybody was. Yeah, <laughs> ten years yeah. ago. Um, Probably in the range now, I want to say like eight to nine billion dollars worth of work okay. across uh, the globe. If you count 
you know, all the family companies kind of thing. Yep. Um, we, we specialize in like a, what we call higher tech jobs or, you know, more, um, more technical work. Yeah. Right. So, um, we typically stay in, you know, certain core markets that are a little bit more technical jobs sure. like life science, mm -hmm. higher education, which ends up being, you know, science buildings and research facilities and yeah. things like that. Um, data centers, you know, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, um, you know, the, the idea when that was all established was, you know, we're, we're, we're in markets that, you know, combined are fairly resistant proof, you know, if one's slow, then another one's doing yep. better kind of thing. Um, and then it also builds up a resume of people that, you know, work within these niches. Yep. So we're not going from building a car dealership to building a hospital yeah. and trying to use the same yeah. people kind of thing. Um, and so that's turned into, you know, like a lot of repeat clients and yep. a lot of, you know, um, folks that, you know, recognize the value in, mm -hmm. you know, having that kind of workforce and, yeah. you know, going always like looking at those kind of projects. So, yep. um, but you know, it, like I said, it's a big company. We, we try to act like a, a medium sized company. We try to, you know, really pay a lot of attention to our culture and, mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of focus on taking care of people and a lot of focus on our craft. We, we, we sell perform, um, uh, lots of different scopes, yep. um, kind of depending on which market we're in. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus, like I said, on, um, you know, making sure the craft are part of, you know, the team. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I talked about being in, in, in BDC, BDC for a while. I uh, spent 10 years in VDC and I sort of started as like the local manager or whatever for a specific office. Um, and then, you know, over the years, um, grew the team, grew the capabilities, sort of started thinking about, you know, reality capture. We, we, we had, um, I would say we, we went further than dabbling. Like we had yeah. a, a, a team in Northern California that had a scanner and was essentially like, doing services yep. um, for all the DPR. And that was like sporadic, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I was looking at how to incorporate that into our capabilities as a team. Um, and we, we grew that and, um, you know, eventually it went to, for me, it went to a regional role. Um, and the idea there was to kind of take what we did in SoCal and, you know, scale that up yep. and, you know, but look at, well, what's, what's the maturity of this business unit or office when it comes to um, their awareness and understanding of how we can use this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of had to tailor, you know, how we were going to build teams and who we were going to build them around and all mm -hmm. that kind of good stuff. Um, and I got that group up to like 35. Okay. Around uh, the, the Southwest, so Arizona and SoCal. Mm -hmm. Um and then uh, I got an opportunity to join the corporate innovation team. Okay. And um, so now, now my role is uh, West Coast Innovation Leader. It just means that I'm, you know, trying to help us, um, you know, be, be aware, test out, and implement new stuff. Yep. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's not always the same problems that we're trying to solve. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like working, th this is a little bit more vendor facing. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit more like, okay, what, what solutions are out there yeah. and what problems do we have? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how can we devise and like plan out and experiment to test that out? Like we're yeah. constantly piloting stuff. Yeah. Um, Which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it, it allows our teams, like the cool thing about it is that it's not the innovation folks doing it. Like I look at it as almost like safety. Like everybody's an innovator. Everybody's responsible for innovation, mm -hmm. right? In, in in the same way that everybody's you know responsible for safety. And um, you know my my job is just sort of like, okay, here's the process. Here's how we do this. Like you know here's like I'm gonna help determine whether or not we should test something out. Like mm -hmm. I have a lot of history. And there's a lot of information that we have database wise, like on stuff that we have done. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so people will be like, well, you know, I have this problem on this job or I really want to test this out. Um, and, and our job is to sort of help them go yeah. through the process and determine like, all right, what are we trying to find out? Like, mm-hmm. what is, you know, what is the solution promising? And uh, can we prove that value proposition? Yeah, that's awesome. So what would be, you know, obviously you guys, you guys probably are, are, like you said, you're doing different pilots, different problems. Um, what's like a problem right now? You know, I, I sh- I'm sure you guys probably talk through like, you know, what are some things that we want to try to address or, you know, what, what are some things you're working on at the moment? Um, yeah, a lot. So, um, you know, having the background in VDC and, um, you know, doing, doing a lot with our, our, what we call field tech, which is basically our reality capture and field yeah. engineering, um, thing, not, not, not unlike what you guys are doing yeah. here at Nexus. Yep. Um, there's uh bring, bringing that to the table. Um, I kind of get, you know, some things that fall into those categories. So, um, personally, I'm looking at augmented reality. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm keeping a tab on, on, on VR. Um, I'm very interested in new scanners that are coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we've done a lot of great work when it comes to reality capture. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we've stayed with like, the, the terrestrial scanners yep. for the most part. Um, we've done quite a bit with drones and photogrammetry and a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, but we haven't really got big into like the mobile scanners yep. and things like that. We kind of went straight to, um, you know, the more um, precise and, yep. and, 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 you know, broadly able yeah. to use equipment kind of thing. Yep. Um, so, now it's kind of like, well, you know, what, how can we supplement that? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a certain part of, you know, or, or use cases that we're not really covering when it comes to the terrestrial scanners. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, the wearables and things like that, that have, you know, we're kind of sitting on yeah. for a little while, yeah, you know, um, we, we actually invested in an early company that was doing some of it. Um, and I just think like the timing wasn't quite yeah. right in some ways. Um, you know, we weren't, we weren't quite as well versed in like what you can do with a point cloud and, you know, all, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So it's like, well, it doesn't really yeah. matter if we can get one faster, <laughs> yep. you know? Yep. Um, and, and so now it's like, okay, well we have this like quality assurance, you know, this stuff down. We can do concrete scanning. It seems like everybody's doing concrete scanning now these days. Um, and so it's like, well, what about, what about other jobs? What about yeah. the TIs and, and things like that, that, you know, we don't have, usually have a lot of time. Um, you know, maybe we don't need the precision yeah. of, uh, you know, a focus 3d or an RTC or something mm-hmm. like that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in like the Navis VLX, for yep. example. Yep. Um, you know, GeoSlam's probably set to come out with something new yep. here soon. Um, so I think, you know, the, the processing and a lot of that technology has come to a point where now we can collect data a lot faster, process it mm-hmm. a lot faster. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at a lot of that stuff. Um, I'm also looking at how, um, how to empower folks that want to innovate. Yeah. You know, um, and I think like, I think we do a really good job of that Yeah, as it is. Yeah. Um, but I think that awareness around what people can actually do. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, so it's, it's, we're in this weird, weird spot where we're trying to like focus a little bit more on those challenges. Yep. So you asked like, what, what, what challenges are you, are you trying to, tackle um right now one of the challenges is like understanding our challenges yes. <laughs> right yeah so yeah. um you know the whole industry is talking about being data driven you know mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff and so we're trying to go we're trying to shift a little bit from uh you know like finding a solution and trying to fit that to a problem that we know we have yep and sort of flip that yeah. And go, okay, well, what, what problems do we have? What problems do we need to solve? 
And then can we make a specific strategic effort to like yeah. solve that? Yeah. And yeah. I really, I really like that. Um, because if we can align on the challenges that we have and the results because of those challenges, mm-hmm. then, you know, everybody will sort of understand the downstream business impacts of those challenges. Yep. And now we can all rally around, like, let's, let's figure out that issue and, and solve that. Yeah. One thing um, I think you're, um, you know, I think we've been on the same path on is like you mentioned, you guys kind of looked at like wearables and you, you were looking at some stuff early and it wasn't quite there and you're, you're not fully in the mobile stuff yet. You kind of went with the terrestrial and, you know, um, I'd say we're, we've been on that same path and it's something that, um, I talked about this in one of our, in our kickoff episode where a lot of people ask like, what's the new thing you're working on or what's the new technology you want right. to see? And I'm like, I just want to see more people use what's already here and actually do it well, you know, because so many people do run out and buy the newest gear and they get one of each scanner and they, you know, it's like we, we need to educate more people on how to properly collect data and how to make sure the accuracy is where it needs to be for a certain job or, you know, what's the benefit of the terrestrial versus the nav is or the geo slam or a drone or, um, and the the educating of how to implement those um, before like worrying about what's new and and next getting to the point that now that stuff is working so smooth and you can start to expand into those other use cases is a a really cool spot to be um so i just yeah we're i i feel you there yeah (laughs) when you and you can't like jump on the new stuff right away like testing and stuff i think is Legit, mm-hmm. but um, you know, it it you shouldn't just be buying the next thing just to buy it, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think that we did we did well is that we we dabbled in it a little bit, um, and then from my perspective, I was like, well, I I I know I want to buy a scanner, but I don't know which one. So mm-hmm. let's figure out what we're going to use that for. And so I found like locally, I found an opportunity to leverage the scanner for something that we were already doing, which was floor flatness. Yep. And so I dove head heads deep in into understanding what needed to happen um, in, in order to do that. And there wasn't, you know, there wasn't that many barriers other than just understanding like how to collect the data and how can we get a good report and how can we, you know, convince folks that um, or show them, I shouldn't say convince, but, you know, show them that it was accurate enough. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and that, you know, there was actually more benefit to it. So yeah, we, we kind of went for that and were able to sort of, you know, get, get some interest and show folks like what's possible, Yep. you know, and then roll that from, okay, we're, we're looking at things after things are poured to let's go do it while it's, wet and and now you know get into other things that influence the quality and that that started you know getting people's gears going so yeah. that was sort of a justification to get the equipment but it was based on use case yep right it was based on use case and what we could do with it the software that went with it and like okay we can do this and then if we have that then i can also do existing conditions i can also do you know, progress in, you know, different things like that. So yep. um, that's kind of how we headed, you know, with like, well, let's get one that we can do a bunch of things with. Yep. Right. Yep. Rather than specific, like, oh, scan to BIM, all we need is a BLK or something like that. Yeah. You know, we went with something that we could use like across the board and yeah, um, it's grown quite a bit since then, but yeah. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you think back to any major headaches or anything oh, yeah. that you ran into that you oh, yeah. share something <laughs> specific job <laughs> or think, workflow or something that you, uh, well, I mean, you know, when it's, when it's, um, part of, you know, the, like having it internally, um, there's, there's a little bit of like, well, we, you know, if we add scope, like it's no big deal. Just, yeah. you know, kinda <laughs> just, just go do it, you know, kind of thing. Um, and and we were trying to run it a little bit more like an internal you know project or business kind of thing and you know have um you know track the accounting and stuff yeah. like that so when we got hit with changes like that was that was a big um challenge but some of the challenges has been um 
you know, things where we didn't use control. Yeah. You know, um, or and or when we, uh, you know, cut corners in that way, but then realized like, oh, we needed to scan more or, you know, having to go back or, um, you know, there's 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 been a couple times, um, which I think one is too many, but like where we we started registering data, you know, before we had like everything mm. um, and started to piece it together, which would have been fine. But then we were trying to create other things on top of that, you know, yeah. as we were going. And so stuff um, moves and yeah, yeah, you know, like you get sure. if you don't have your stair stairwells, like yeah. all of them. Um, and that's what you're relying on to get your floor to floor heights and mm -hmm. you know things like that. Um, so I think we've had, you know, probably the same struggles as yep. most other, um, you know, companies that have dabbled into it. Um, but I mean, effort wise, like, you know, some of the early ones having to go you know, target by target, like I remember yeah. having to do that stuff one time on, uh, I was on vacation and I'm like, <laughs> like writing all the target labels and this is, you know, before cloud to cloud. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we've had some of the same, you know, challenges yep. that, that the other folks have where it's like yeah. convincing folks that, um, you know, the value that you're going to get out of it um, is, is there. Um, and since then we've done a good job of like talking about the ROI, you know, on, on certain projects and looking at like, well, you know, we did this, how much re rework did we prevent? Yeah. Um, you know, and then it gets into, well, who's, who's, who, whose money are you really saving and yeah. <laughs> stuff like yeah. that. But, um, yeah, you know. I think what's your, what's your, just some thought around like the ROI piece when, you know, that conversation is, is hard sometimes when like certain projects, the value of the scanning is that you're reducing the potential of, of spends. It's like it, sometimes c companies have a hard time wrapping their head around how do you even come up with the ROI on a certain type of, of build project. And you guys, as someone who's actually doing the build, obviously you've probably investigated that pretty deep. Yeah. Like what, how, how do you come up with that? Like depends on the, the case, right? Um, when like the specific case I was thinking of was pre poor scanning, mm. right? So we were, we were analyzing to make sure that we had all the embeds, that we had the openings in the right place, um, and all that kind of stuff. And that particular job, it was like, well, you know, if we found an embed, how much would it have cost if we had, yeah, know, like poured and had to like chip it out and yeah. put, it, put it in a different spot or you know that kind of thing. So um, when it comes to like tenant improvement, existing condition stuff, I think it's harder to to talk about how much you prevented. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what I think is like challenging, but also like the biggest opportunity with reality capture is that it's very much like it reminds where we're at with it reminds me of where we were 10, 15 years ago with with BIM and mm -hmm. BDC, um, where it's, you know, it, it, we kind of talk about the uh, a pound of cure or ounce of cure, pound of prevention mm -hmm. or pound, whatever it is, pound of prevention. <laughs> Yep. ounce of prevention, pound of cure. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's like insurance, Yeah, you know? Um, and I think what we're right on the cusp of is clients and owners understanding this Yeah, and starting to put standards together, mm -hmm. starting to put requirements. Um, and that, you know, that was from my perspective anyway, with VDC, that was when things yeah. started to take off. Yeah. Right. That's when, that's when the wave sort of starts to break and it's like, okay, it's, it's go time. Yeah. Um, and I, think I think we're seeing right that there. Change, yeah. Seeing that change over the last several years where, you know, and I, I tell people about this is like those of us that have been scanning for 10 years or something, you know, 10 years ago, there were, there weren't a bunch of RFPs for laser scanning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the only people that were implementing laser scanning were people who, found out about the gear, tried it on jobs, trialed it, found value. It wasn't typically required at that time on right. almost any jobs, at least from my knowledge. I mean, um, I know it, it started out heavily in like refineries, really complex facilities, things like that. But it's, it's getting to the point now over the last several years where it's like, 
any major renovation, any, you know, you look at airports or hospitals or it's getting to the point that it's part of the RFP now, you know, yeah. part, part of the scopes are, hey, we, we, we have understood because we've done it on a few jobs now, we're requiring you go out there and capture the existing conditions, you update, you know, an existing BIM for the design team to start from, you hand that off, like that's actually moving that direction. Yeah. Um, and I think for certain major projects or industries it is, but I think over the next few or, or several years, it's going to become just like it is with BIM now, you know, yeah. you don't, unless it's a residential, I mean, even residentials in BIM, uh, it's very rare to go find a job that someone just wants a 2D design, you know? Yeah. Um, we're, and, and the other piece for like renovations and expansion work is most of the historic documentation is in 2D. So it's, right. it's getting to the point that all of the capture, all of the design, everything is moving to that 3D environment. And I think it's just going to keep changing that way. And the standards, the the requirements, the educating the clients and the owners and the users. And, you know, as everybody solidifies that knowledge base, I think that just helps advance it. Yeah. There's like something that I think about is, well, you know, not necessarily trying to solve a problem, but like what, if you can digitize and bring the job to anyone anywhere, what kind of barriers does that break down? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's, I mean, it just, it, it provides a whole different uh, aspect of what, what a, a construction site could look like. Yeah. Um, and, and how we get started. Like, you know, we, we to, to me, there's, you know, the, the, the savvy owners, the savvy clients are starting to recognize that I'm going to have to remodel, I'm going to have to renovate at some point. Um, and a lot of times we're in the dark, right? We have to start completely over. Yep. And if I document, if I say require folks to document this as we go, mm-hmm. then, you know, now the idea of a digital twin and like yep. all these things start to become a little bit more of a reality. And then the next time you do a project, you have that information and now you're start not starting from scratch. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's starting to like, you know, we've talked about the, the, the value proper, getting, getting the ROI. I think that folks are starting to see that it's not tangible always right away, but, you know, where we were relying on these, you know, old inaccurate as built and we saw value in that. And it's like, well, what if you can validate that? What if you can just, you know, yeah. digitize what you have and pull that in and start from a better starting point and then, you know, end and you know, document. I mean, it's just so yeah. much like, like I said, if you can, if you can digitize the, the job site at any time and bring it to anybody, like, what could you do with that? And yeah. there's the, uh, it's, it's so big. It's like, you know, reality capture has become this huge term. Yep. It's this, this like, you know, category of, of, of technology. And there's yeah. just so much we can, just so much potential. You yeah. Know? And, it, you know, I think originally when the term reality capture started coming around, like, I think initially it was it was a term for laser scanning, maybe. Uh, but I feel like it's morphed, it's morphed into really everything to do with bringing a physical space into digital. Yeah. That's what I at least see it as is like if it has to do with digitizing a physical asset or a physical site, whether it be by scanning drone photo documentation, the idea of starting to merge those physical and digital, um, that's what I see reality capture as to me. And yeah. I, and I think that idea of, you know, you mentioned the digital twin piece, right? Obviously, that's a big word that there's like 174 definitions for, depending <laughs> on uh, who you ask. Um, you know, and I think what you talked about is is more what I see as the the foundation for digital twin. You know, some people are are posting and talking about like, hey, we can come, you know, make a photo mesh of your site, and now you have a real digital twin. I'm like, that's just a 3D mesh. That's just yeah. a model. Like to me, digital twin is it is that f- that f- digital replica of your physical site with with more the information than just a 3D model. Yeah. Um, but the benefits that come, like you said, is if 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 owners start to realize the value in BIM, the value in scanning, 
there's a whole no- another level of value by keeping those updated. Right. By, you know, we, we see clients getting to the point where instead of just scan, model, design, build, throw it away and start over later, right. it's like, okay, we actually have three phases of scanning. We have scan the existing building. Okay, now we're going to design, we're going to do this renovation. We're going to scan during construction yeah. and do photo documentation for the QC against the design and make sure we reduce change orders and, you know, uh, the BIM coordination piece with all that data. And then once everything's done, we're going to scan again right. and update that model. So you have a real model of, of exactly how the site sits now. Yeah. And then there's the whole other step of, okay, can we push that to facilities maintenance and to safety planning and, you know, other, other uses for it? To me, that's like the idea of digital twin is keeping that accurate updated model that if you need information, you can go in and pull it and you know that it's correct. Right. Um, and then the piece of, of the additional information behind it, maybe linking in for that facilities piece or something, but yeah. And that's, that's why it's been so exciting for me because as you know, BIM VDC focused person for a while, you know, to me, that's the plan. Like you need to put in, you know, we, we, we talk a lot at DPR about planning it right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we need to put information into how we're building it. And that's always been the model for me. And reality capture, scanning, all this stuff comes along. And to me, that's how you pull the actual. That's how you digitize the actual. And now you have something that you can start to compare. Yep. And all these other technologies that we talk about start to converge where it's like, okay, now you've got, you know, we talk, we talk about being data driven. It's like, well, now you have data of your plan and your actual. Now you start pulling that together and you start adding you know, AI and machine yep. learning and different things that are now augmenting our people. Yeah. Right. And now you can start to focus on different things, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the whole idea behind coordination is it's like, let's make sure everything works yeah. so that we can just go put it in place and yep. avoid rework. And it's like, okay, well now let's make sure that we're, that we're doing that. Yeah. And people are starting to like, okay, let's put these things together and now we can start monitoring you know, are we putting things in the right place? Is that going to create a clash in the future? Mm-hmm. Things that aren't there yet. Um, how can we, you know, get this, get all that information out to the field and communicate back and forth? And so, you know, again, it's like we're 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 bringing the job site to the office, and we're trying to bring the data to the field, like all at the same time. So it's like it's 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 a really cool time, and I think that that those sides of it and that the workflows that you described, like that's going to be something that we do more and more. Like yeah. I see that on bigger jobs where, you know, um, there's more risk or more interest in having that information at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like, you know, the, the pattern is that always, that always trickles down, Yeah, you know, um, as it becomes easier to do, easier yep. to capture the data, quicker to turn it around, you know, you're going to see more, you know, smaller jobs yeah. that, that are going to, you know, benefit from it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and then there's, a, there's an other side that, you know, we, we talked about owners and clients um, and, you know, something that also happened with, with BIM was standards started to be developed. Yep. Right. Um, IPD stuff, you know, guides came out, the BIM uh, level of, of development, you know, was formed. Which all some these people kind still of struggle with. A lot of people Wait, still LOD struggle. has what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> but, you know, there's, so what I'm, what I'm leading into is I got involved in the US IBD, or the US Institute of Building Documentation, yep. because I, they, were, they were putting those standards together. Yeah. Right? Um, and at the time, um, there wasn't a whole lot of GCs like involved in that. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was working with some folks that were like, Hey, you, you know, you should come check this out. We're, we're you know, developing these, these, these standards, um, and, you know, trying to educate people on this stuff, much like you are. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that it, it's, it hasn't really taken off, but it, it was sort of ahead of its time yeah. in some ways. Yeah. Right. Like now, yeah. now we're at a point where, you know, as owners, you know, and, and, and clients start looking at, 
well, how do I get the most out of it? Hopefully they start finding those things yeah. and saying, well, you know, oh, here's a, here's a spec for a level of accuracy that I yep. can, you know, say that I want it to be this accurate. Yeah. Um, I think we'll have, <laughs> we'll have some of the similar misunderstandings. Sure. That we do yeah. with, um, models in some, in some ways, um, in particular, because there's like a measured accuracy and then there's like a represent yeah represent representative yep. accuracy. Yep. Um, and so I think just, you know, uh, making sure that people understand that concept. Yeah. Right. And yeah. like why there there's two and yeah, you know, it's kind of like a surveying thing where like, as your, as your, uh, error sort of compounds, like you can't be more accurate than the error that you had in the previous network kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a very similar relationship there with level of accuracy. So, yeah. um, you know, but the fact that it's there, yeah, and it's something that people can use, I think is important. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I've been involved with, with them for a number of years and, you know, we're, we're trying to get, uh, more awareness around yep. the standards, get people to, you know, use them. Yep. Um, and, and adopt them. And they're, they're, just trickling in here yeah. and there. I've seen a couple of standards where, you know, or requirements. Yep. Yeah. Same. Same. We've that, that require yep. it. So we've seen some projects where you know in their RFP with the scopes of scanning or scan to BIM that we're we're looking over. You know, they have the LOD documents in there. They have an LOA document in there, um, and I think those things are super important. Um, and like we talked about with the LOD thing, it's like some people still have no idea which LOD they're like, we want 300. And they're like, I don't even know what that means, but yeah. I think we want the middle one. It's, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love at, when they make them up. That's, yes. That's the best. I would like 375 <laughs> with, <laughs> with like maybe five more on there. Yeah. Um, just, it, 380. Cause it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think the fact that the, that the fact that it started, right? Like yes. there's enough, there's an attention to it. There's a, there's a knowledge that right. something needs to be there. It's the foundation has been laid and, and it's getting going. Even if people don't understand what the numbers mean yet, they at least start to ask questions as to why is there an LOA? Well, what type of scanner should we be asking for in the RFP for this type of work? Yeah. Because that's the piece that I'm really trying to focus on educating as well is there's not been very many resources out there to help understand, okay, why would, why would I hire someone to come do this project with a Matterport or a Navis or a right. GeoSlam or a Leica or, a, or if you're someone purchasing to do the services, right? Yeah. Why would I spend $3,000 or $15,000 or $150,000? Like some, some people don't put the attention into it to really understand the differences in those. And I think historically our industry has had quite a bit of hurt from from those of us who didn't have any training or education, right? We, everyone that, that got into this early bought whatever scanner they ended up getting yeah. sold and tried it out on jobs and, you know, have worked through that process of how do I integrate control? How accurate is this data really? You know, what's the registration report really telling me? You know, all of those things have been worked through painfully for, for the oh, last yeah. 10 years. Some of it is still there though, you know, and there, I think there's still a lack of education for the fact that this is becoming more widely adopted. I think there's a lot of companies that are just now buying a scanner. And there's companies like we've talked about that we've been re really deep into a certain scanner, but now we're like, okay, how do we integrate yeah. mobile or handheld or, and then making sure we understand how do we properly control those? How do we properly keep them accurate enough for the use case that they have? Right. And so I think the continued education on all levels to the people that are actually getting the gear and doing the service to the, you know, company hiring the service to the end owner, knowing what they're paying for, you know, I think the continued education and standardization of that whole process is so important because yeah. it, it, and, and the, the more we do there and the better we do in helping people do it properly, it just helps the industry because we, we start to reduce the amount of those headaches of, you know, most of us that have been scanning a long time, we've talked to a company about scanning and they're like, oh, I tried that five years ago and, you know, it came out terrible. It's not good enough for what we need. 
But really the answer is, okay, well, it was probably early. It yeah. was someone who didn't know the process yet. The technology is amazing. And that's why, that's why I still answer that question about what's next of, I don't care about what's next. I just want to make this whole ecosystem that exists. It's great technology. There's a lot available. I just want to make all of that work better and create those standards like you talked about of how can a company plug and play all the different technology that exists now into a workflow that solves what they want to do for a project. Right, because if you don't have that somewhat established, what's next doesn't really matter because you can't really, it yeah. doesn't really fit. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, and then we, we kind of struggle with that within our own ecosystem, if you will. Like, yeah. okay, we have a lot of stuff like, okay, well, what would that do for us? Like, you know, uh, does it, does it reduce our capture time or turnaround time, you know, but what, what, what is the, what am I sacrificing yeah. from that? Um, and you know, what, 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 what use, use cases are we limited to? And mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, but I, I agree that like having that, having that foundation of like the pull from the clients, the standards being developed, the industry, you know, pushing it and, and finding more value at, at, at all levels. I mean, I see, I see trade partners doing it. I see GCs mm -hmm. doing it. Um, you know, obviously there's service providers, whether they're popping up and they're just doing scanning or doing yep. you know, survey and, um, and so it, it, it feels like we're right on the cusp of all this, you know, yeah. taking off. And now, you know, it's like, okay, maybe people will start to understand like different tools, different jobs, like yep. scanners aren't created equal, just the same way. Like, you know, every couple of years, it, the camera, you know, gets upgraded yep. or, you know, like you're going to use a DSLR versus, you know, an iPhone for yep. certain things, yep. like depending on what you want to do with it. But you're not going to carry the DSLR in your pocket, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> right. So the phone still has a good, but you know, that's, that's, that's what has to start happening with this technology is I think most people look at all of the capture devices and they just look for either a cheaper option or a higher quality. And I think there's so many options now that it has to start being, okay, we need to start at the start at the result and work our way backwards to yeah. tell you what, what, you your, out of it? what your workflow and what your equipment should be, where a lot of people are still in that mindset of, you know, I've, I've heard clients where it's like, oh, you know, this, this bid went to this person because they were, you know, $8,000, the other competitors were 20 and 40. That immediately should make you stop and go, yeah. wait, why is that one so much cheaper? Why is it so much lower, you know, yeah. Because again, you you have to know why it's cheaper or which unit yeah. is being used. Um, you know, for construction work, if you're gonna do floor flatness reports, how are you integrating control or a process that you make sure your data is sitting flat? Because what happens if you do a floor flatness report and your data is tilted? Yeah. How flat, you know, is your report gonna be? Well, then what goes, what happens if someone goes and tries to fix it based on a report that's not accurate? Yeah. Or if you use a photogrammetry unit that the data is just like an average as opposed to actually hitting points on the ground, right. or there's so many pieces there that, that people don't know. I mean, I don't even know the answers to all of them. We, we don't, we, we have to continue to dig into those. And that's where I want to continue to make educational material on explaining that process and working with the vendors, working with people who are hands-on trialing and using it in different applications is the industry as a whole needs more understanding of how those processes really work to make sure that it's, it's just the right workflow. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting aspect of, let's just say laser scanning in particular, that I don't think everybody sort of grasps right away that, you know, you, you talked about one of the phases being like during construction, right? And what I find really interesting about laser scanning and some of the other things is that you, if, you, if you have like a cadence or you have like a specific thing that you're going for, that you're gonna scan for, just the act of bringing the scanner and doing that one thing opens up a whole bunch of doors for different yeah. types of analysis for quality control or so, um, you know, to bring that to like a real world example, like if you're building a concrete structure and you're like, well, you know, I mentioned we sell perform. One of the things, things we sell perform is concrete. So we're constantly talking about quality and, mm -hmm. you know, all this kind of stuff. So, um, 
you know, if you want the best quality, let's compare what we're doing right now to the plan, right? Yeah. So if we're going to put this time into the plan and we're going to have all this stuff in terms of our hangers and our openings and, you know, penetrations and all this stuff is going to be located in that information, let's start scanning it. And you can scan for pre-pour, but now when you're scanning for pre-pour, I just captured everything above, right? Yeah. And so now I have something and we've, we've, we've used that. We've got, been able to go back um, and, and be able to show like, oh, we can analyze the beam deflection and tell you what, you know, what it really did. Yep. Um, and really understand like how things are moving when we shore and reshore, like whatever, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you know, how, how things move around when they're, when they're weighted. And, you know, I think that's going to tell us, you know, that's gives us a result of, you know, the engineering that went into it. So mm -hmm. I think all that's really interesting and in, 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 in introducing data where we didn't have data right yeah. and i think that we're so floor flatness is one one area where it's like okay well the way we used to do it is like i get one line mm -hmm. you know and that's the only data i got yep and now i can get the whole surface yeah and you know i if i do it beforehand i have all the you know everything that's inside the deck so you have all this information um and just like with developing a model like you can get a whole bunch of different stuff out of it. Yeah. And so that's where you, when you, when we talk about ROI for reality capture, it's like, well, you can put this much into it and get all these things out. If you don't do that one enabling thing, then you're not gonna be able to do all this other stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's like the more you do with the data, the more you actually get return out of it. So that's, that's another thing that I think is really interesting about it. Um, is that, you know, it tends to be like, like I said, you know, the, the, sort of the more you put into it um, in a way where you sort of reach this like critical mass of like, if I do all this stuff, then I can do a yep. whole bunch of additional things that just having that one scan or, you know, inserting one mobilization here allows us to do all these, you know, other things or have information to go back on. Like that, that kind of thing is, 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 you know, it's really important and it's really impactful. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably something most people that get into scanning start to realize is like, okay, we got into it for a specific use, mm -hmm. but then you get this data and you're like, oh my gosh, we have, you know, it's funny, people who don't know scanning yet, they're like, hey, I know you came out and scanned this, this the floor, but do you did you get the beams that are right next to the floor? You're yeah. like, dude, we, it captures everything. Yeah. Like, you know, that's what you start to realize with this data is the different uses. And that's, like you said, the value of all of the different uses. You know, even for um, not even just like on a specific job like that, but just when you even start to talk about the digital twin piece or an overall facility or building, it's like, you guys need evacuation plans. You're looking to try to push into VR. You want to start moving into smart buildings where you have wayfinding, like, there's all of these things that long term where we start seeing this technology go by integrating 3D, capturing a model that's accurate. You know, you can start doing a lot more than just what the initial use case was. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the idea of, like I mentioned, you know, just the continued expansion and use of the existing tools, like to me, the long-term dream, right, is that most of the companies that are fully utilizing and adopting scanning, drones, scan to BIM, reporting and analysis of data, it's like whether they're using a service provider or whether they're doing it in-house, which is all over the board as well. You know, some companies yeah. are bringing it internal. Some are like, we don't want to, we want to outsource it. Um, I think the dream is that most projects end up using all of the technologies. Like, you know, you've got the backpacks and the handhelds that are mobile, that are fast. A lot of companies will end up, I think, using something very quick like that, even on a pre-walk. We, we've had some yeah. projects where we went and we went out and scanned for a company before they even won the job because they want to be able to put a comprehensive plan together yeah. of, of here's what we're proposing to the client. We want to show that we've got digital data, right. we, you know? So I think the idea is like, use something fast and easy to use to capture a quick overall 
site, and then you start to refine down as you need the higher accuracy or the higher level of detail. And a key piece of that, you know, being a survey company, we push survey a lot, but, um, you know, the survey control, it has to end up becoming the base for integrating all those technologies. Yeah. And, and the one, one danger risk I keep seeing in the scanning world is people who buy the scanner, but don't know about survey. Yeah. Like we, we have done, way too many projects to understand that when you start going linear, you start going up multiple levels, you start, you get into complex sites, no matter what scanner you have, the, the survey control piece is what can help global accuracies right. stay there on a job. Um, as well as the things like we talked about with like the levelness of the floor or the building, or I know how these water bottles are like <laughs> shaking. Um, you know, so I, I see the future being on most job sites that survey control gets established on or around a site and a building, you end up hitting it with a uh, drone for like an entire project limits. You end up walking it with something mobile to get interiors and facades. And then as you get into higher accuracy needs, you integrate the terrestrial. I, I have seen that on a couple jobs where it's like fully utilizing and maximizing some of the existing tech and that is ideal yeah. because why spend the extra time and cost using the highest grade system for the exterior where you just kind of want to know, you know, rough information. Yeah. Like it, it, but I think the terrestrial, which is why both of us talked about, that's where we started because it's the most diverse. Like yeah. you can use the terrestrial for almost everything. You can use it for the outside site. You can use it above ceiling, which is actually one of those that mobile's more difficult. Um, so the terrestrial unit for people that are getting started now is the most diverse, but the idea of starting to see those technologies merge as, as, as people understand how to merge them and maybe where the different accuracies of different units or densities play well together um, I think that's kind of the next step is again, not a brand new crazy technology, but how do we start really maximizing projects and the growth of the industry by mixing all of them that exist? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, well, I think I, I agree with you. I think we'll see a heightened awareness around the importance of survey and control. Um, I think everybody's understanding like the addition of data, like being data driven, like, mm -hmm. okay, we, we have, we have data now, what's the data telling us kind of thing. Um, and when, when, when you introduce scanning to somebody, they, when you don't dive in to really understand like what, what it's doing, you don't understand the gap in being able to, um, collaborate and like bring data together in a way that's going to be useful. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's, it's very similar to like what we talked about with um, VDC and like the coordinates of models, mm -hmm. right? It was like, for long, you know, we still talk about this and, mm -hmm. you know, it still becomes a challenge every now and then, but it's a very similar concept. It's just virtual control. Yeah. Right what's your coordinate system in there and what's your coordinate system over here? And if they're not, if we can't figure out how to, you know, what the relationship is between those two things, then we're not going to be able to combine those and do what we want to do. And now we're doing the same thing. We're just talking about the real world and digitizing the real world and making sure that we're telling the computers that are dumber than people think mm -hmm. that this is where this goes. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's, it, we're not going to get around that. No. Like we're, we're, I think that on a long enough timeline, some of the technologies for localizing the mm -hmm. data will eventually be integrated. Yeah. But I question whether or not we'll have the, the accuracy to, you know, do things without any control yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I think just generally people are, or, or at least what I'm seeing is that there's, more awareness into the, just the importance of control. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Like forget reality capture for a second. Yeah. Everything you build is going to be based off of your control. Yeah. 
um, you know, the accuracy of that network, like literally determines where you put stuff yep. from, from day one. Yep. So when we start to understand that and then realize, oh, well, to do this thing, it's really important to have that as yeah. well. Um, now I think we'll start to see like more, a little bit more focus on a little bit more like, oh, okay, that is, that is important. Um, I actually disagree with you on, on the, on the doing it. everything. Yeah. Right. I don't think that I, I saw that with BDC too. I was, I used to, I used to always used to get asked what jobs have we done everything on? Mm. And I'm like, none. Yeah. But that like, they're looking for like, oh, we did this job, you know, we did this, we did, mm -hmm. well, there's like a menu, right? It's like, yeah. okay, if I'm gonna do a model, like we should always do coordination. Like that's just a, yeah. you know, the design process is iterative and we're looking at it from a different perspective. Like, you know, that's a whole nother thing that I think eventually we could get away from that yep. kind of stuff. But, um, you know, that's a reimagination of how yeah. everything's done. Yeah. Um, and I think it's possible, but, um, you know, just because we have a model doesn't mean we're going to do auto based estimate doesn't mean we're going to do visual planning and have a sequence. And, you know, it doesn't mean that we're going to have full blown shop drawings out of that model. Like there's, so if you look at like everything yeah. that we can do, you know, if you True. look at the, the Penn state guide, you know, for VDC is like 25 different yeah. you know, uses. So the, the practicality of doing all those things. And again, I draw an analogy between VDC and reality capture. We're at a stage where it's like, if you break down and we've kind of done this, yeah. where if you break down situations, use cases and like objectives, and then the different technology you can use, like it's, it's, it's not going to make sense to use yeah. everything on true on every job. I think that we, we can start to think more strategically about what makes sense to get, like if we're going for, for a specific value mm -hmm. of supporting the coordination process, validating the existing conditions, um, documenting our progress, looking at quality control, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So, and, and again, you do one thing or you do a few things and it enables a lot of stuff, Yeah. but everything I think is too, true, too much, yeah. right? Like, like you're, we get to a point where it's like, you're going to go past the value that you really yeah. want. But I think that, do I think that every job could incorporate reality capture? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you look at the broad spectrum, like if you go just to 360 photos, like that's a form of reality capture. Do yep. I think every, every project should have that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if for just the sake of having pictures on plans and having context about when those pictures were taken and what's yep. there, and we've gotten a ton of value out of that. Yeah. Um, but I think that we'll see us trying to put together like a map for each job, like yep. a, a plan for each job yep. to say, you know, just like we do with VDC, there's all these use cases like, okay, well, what is this job's challenges or what are this job's um, aspirations? What does this team want to get out of this? What does the owner want to get out of it? And work all those things back to, okay, well today we need to set control yep. and tomorrow we need to scan and we need this level of accuracy. So we're going to, because we're going to do this, later on. And so that's, that's the kind of thinking yes. that we need, yeah. you know, to go through. And I, I don't, I don't think we'll see a lot of jobs that are like using, you know, a mobile scanner, a terrestrial scanner, you know, LIDAR flying on a drone and 360 photos like that'll happen. Yeah. And that's happening today, of course. But, you know, there's going to be jobs where, you know, we don't need all that yep. stuff. Right. So, yeah, totally. Um, so I think that there's the, the term that we use when we, we talk about some of the smaller jobs is like, we need to be surgical. Yep. Right. Correct. And I think that we're, we're, we're at a point now where like, we're seeing a lot of the big jobs get a lot of, um, value out of capturing on a regular basis, using quicker capture methods that may not be quite as precise, yep. but they work for the specific use case. Yep. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more of that. I think we'll see more capture, um, on a long enough timeline, I, I, I think we're going to see some sort of passive capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're, we, we, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned the digital twin, the, the, the big buzzword right now, but like, you know, it kind of goes back to that 
that question I contemplate of what if we can bring the job to anybody at any time? Well, like if you have a digital twin of the current construction progress or pr project, you could literally bring anybody to it. It just depends on how much, how often you're capturing data and how old that information is. Yep. Um, so I think we'll see some interesting changes, pivots, uh, in terms of how we capture that information. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we're very reliant on people and robotics mm -hmm. to do that stuff. Um, and I wonder what would happen if we didn't have to move cameras around and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. That's something I've, I've never really talked about a lot either, but, um, you know, I've, I've actually had a couple inquiries on something like that. Uh, you know, mostly, not for like a full building or something, but from starting at something like volumetrics, right? Or like yeah. a stockpile. Hey, can, is there some way for you to like continuously scan right. and tell us, you know, what the volume is, you know, can you just install something here? Right. And it kind of gets your mind thinking about that. And then there's the piece on even like buildings and interiors. Obviously we've all seen the spot robot dog with the scanners on it and you know, I, I don't think there's very many people fully utilizing it yet. Um, and I don't think it's quite there, but I think it's, I think it gets us down that path of like, here's the introduction to, yeah. you could put a, a scanner on a dog, have it programmed to know the floor plan of the already mapped building. And at night it's going to go walk it and recapture the progress with images and scans. And now we're not reliant on, okay, well, what's the cost for someone to come out? Are you available in the next two weeks? And it doesn't you know. sound crazy because half, you know, half the people have a, a Roomba that's yeah. vacuuming their house yeah. and doing a lot of the same stuff. Making its so, own floor plan, avoiding and, stuff. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying about, well, what's, you know, people ask what the next big thing is. It's like, it's probably already here in some ways. We just haven't figured out how to really capitalize on yeah. what it is, yeah. right? So, you know, I think reality capture, like I've said, is kind of like the next wave of things that are going to, you know, revolutionize construction. Um, but I had my first demo of a scanner in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. And it was like, okay, well, this is cool. But, you know, at the time, we didn't really know what to do with it. It nope. was pretty cost prohibitive. <laughs> and, you know, it was kind of like, well, we, we weren't, we weren't doing enough as an industry with models mm -hmm. to really understand that like, okay, now I have plan versus actual. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, the timing wasn't there. It took like 15 minutes to do a single scan and it wasn't very good and yeah. all that kind of, kind of good stuff. But, um, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's moving quite, quite quickly. Um, I had a thought and I, I, I forgot. Oh, the, what, what, what I also find interesting about where things are going is what people aren't talking about right now. Mm. So nobody's, we're not, I don't hear a lot about blockchain oh. or NFTs oh. or we're going there like metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and metaverse and like all this kind of, and a lot of this stuff is like new. We haven't figured out where it goes. So, um, yep. You know, generative design still feels really yep. new. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to be more aware of what people talk about the next big thing. Well, what if like we're yeah. talking about things that are happening like right now? Yeah. I think these things are early, especially in, in construction and we don't really know what to do with them yet. Yep. Um, I mean, you know me, I have ideas, but yeah. Um, you know, I think that it, it start to change things like, yeah. you know, the concept of blockchain and having, uh, you know, like a, a public ledger, like I could see that being very valuable on a project, Yeah. but there's like a cultural shift and a mindset shift that everybody's going to have to have to like have everything sort of transparent. It's very yeah. IPD environment like yeah. situation. Um, and, you know, so I wonder where all that goes and yep. then, you know, do um, do NFTs start to influence the way that we do contracts and can yep. we, can we start to streamline that? And, yep. you know, so there's, there's, you know, and I don't know if the, the mechanism will be, you know, the NFT, but yeah. like something where it's, where we're getting into digital. I, I, I wonder where those, what, what you know, what, yeah. what happens when those start to like, 
legitimately come into the picture. Yeah, and I've heard I've heard some I've heard some very interesting uses. Um, I actually went to a small kind of private expo um, over on the East Coast just a couple months ago, and there was a presentation on the use of blockchain for contracts, hmm. and it. You know what? One thing I find interesting is it feels like there's there's our industry with like the construction engineering survey industry, and then there's like everybody else, else that <laughs> that that yep. sees the big social media side and the podcasting and the influencers and the and there's not very many people that see both sides of that. And they don't, you know, I, I bring up names of people I follow, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Lewis Howes and Joe Rogan and, like, uh, Grant Cardone. These people where I've kind of watched them in in real estate and social media and marketing and branding. And um, that's where I've learned a lot from. And those are the people that are talking about the blockchain and the NFTs right. and the value. And, and a lot of people that come from this construction, engineering, survey side, which I'm like, I find, and same, you know, some of us are like caught in the middle of like aware of both sides, but a lot of people more heavy on the AEC and in that operation side is like, they look at those as kind of like fluffy things. Like what's an, I don't even understand NFTs. It's like a picture and I don't, yet it, it's growing so fast into a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. And people are selling things for millions of dollars. In the, and you're like, what is this? What's yeah, going what's on? And, and what is the blockchain? And, it, you know, it's confusing. You have to go down a rabbit hole to, hole to really start understanding what that whole world is. Um, you know, and I, I don't think I can go deep and explain I it on I'm this. I'm not an expert On either. this, but... You know, the idea is with the blockchain, right, is that it's it's like a verifiable when if you were to use a, a, a contract on the blockchain, it's a transaction that happens that's like outside of your control, right? And it's verified through the blockchain, through different computers. You can't you can't hack it, you know, it's um man, I i I'm the, the value I, is in the in the chain in the transaction of it and the and the ledger side of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so where, where my mind goes is like, well, you have, you know, models, you have generative design, you have like these, these aspects, but what, what isn't fully connected yet is like creating that model and then getting like all the way down to, you know, products and, and things that need to be installed. And to me, that's just like, it's, it's, that's a blockchain. Yep. Like you're going from a building model to something, a smaller component of that, that's still parametrically linked. Like, so there's, there's a, there's a database there. There's a link there. There's, you know, um, and what we possibly have the opportunity to do is like link that to a transaction of like, well, I'm, I'm a trade partner and I'm going to buy that thing. And this is how much it's, you know, and now your bid could be sort of not necessarily public, but on the project's blockchain kind of thing. Yeah. And now everything's sort of connected to like, there's a through line between the design piece that was like, we want to put this in place to the submittal and the purchase and like all of that kind of stuff can be, you know, um, cohesive. Yeah. Because it's connected. And so I just like, yeah, I just find that interesting that we're, you know, we've latched onto reality capture and AI in some aspects. And, um, but there's these other things that are happening outside of AEC that we're sort of like, ah, I don't know what we're going to do with that yet. Let's kind of let them figure it out um, is, is sort of where it feels like. Um, but I'm really interested in like, you know, changing what the barriers are, yeah. or at least trying to influence that. Um, you know, and, and like, I, I think IPD is a really good, good idea. If you execute it well, um, you can, you can, you can have a project that, you know, doesn't have a lot of the same challenges that typical projects do, but it is a lot of effort. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just think it's really, that's it's something that's happening that could be very disruptive. Um, 
and I don't know if we're ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, not that we would be, but like, you know, there's, there's like a level of understanding for, for some of it. Yep. So anyway, you know, I just, I just wonder where that, where that goes. And I think there's, you know, we're, we're constantly getting more and more data, mm-hmm. right? So that means that we're going to, you know, we're going to be doing things with data that we didn't think of Yeah. now, you know, 10 years from now kind of thing. New tech, blockchain, uh, NFTs, the metaverse piece. Oh, yes. That's one that I'm actually very interested in talking about. So, you know, it's, it's, I feel like our industry is the builders of the metaverse. Hmm. So until, until now, that's not really a term that's been being used. Yeah. Um, and of course, with the announcement of metaverse and now every big company is buying into it, looking into it, hiring people with metaverse titles and um, <laughs> everyone's trying to figure out what it actually is and means. Obviously, we've seen some big companies with name changes that, um, you know, are kind of pushing this idea of the future being way more digital. Yeah. You know, the the videos that we see about it are like, hey, you're going to sit at home in your pajamas <laughs> and put your headset on and be transported into, you know, a digital world and you can play in there, you can work, you can. And I think that um, I think some of that obviously is like, OK, is that really going to be the case? Is it? But what I what I like to think about and look at when it comes to metaverse is digitizing the physical world yeah. in a way that you can start mi- mixing the physical and digital yeah. um, as well as like the AR piece of it. And I know there's, there's been other videos out there too of like, Hey, what if you're sitting in your home office and you put AR glasses on yeah. and now you can see your colleagues that are working in the office like you're there. Right. Like, I do think that over the next several years with the investment that's being put into metaverse and creating digital worlds, I think that we're going to see the advancement of AR glasses down to a point that they're more wearable, they're lightweight. Absolutely. Um, I think we're going to see, we already know, I mean, we, we all know there are major investments going on in increasing data and transfer speeds and data housing and processing and that's I, one of the other ones. Yeah. 5G. I, yeah. That can affect everything. I think it's going to get to the point that the AR pieces are there. The environments are being digitized. So it's not even just made up gaming environments. But what happens when you have an airport that has a fully accurate digital twin model that is on a coordinate system and you have people now wearing glasses that they can turn on a, uh, AR and you have digital advertisements as you're walking by stores they can advertise to you digitally through glasses wayfinding wayfinding instead of pulling out your phone and looking down at the ground you just say hey whoever gonna, you gonna are take at you that seven point minutes to walk to your gate <laughs> yeah. you better and, you better and hustle. yeah and it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna pop up in your view and it's gonna tell you your your path and it's gonna be like turn right your gates over here and i think it is gonna get to the point that's what i picture as where are we taking metaverse? It's look, there are real applications of mixing that physical and digital, both from the AR side, the virtual reality side, the augmented reality side. But to me, our industry plays a huge role in that when it comes to those real world applications, because you can't do the wayfinding and the AR digital overlays while you're driving across billboards and whatever, if you don't have accurate geospatial data. And it's the same reason Google's mapping streets, Facebook's mapping build. Like you see everybody doing this data capture, how much data is sitting there ready to pull in and start utilizing for yeah. this. that has been being mapped for years. Yeah. Um, and you see partnerships of, of, and I mean, all of this stuff is public, so it's not like we can't talk about it. You know, um, Facebook and Matterport, Google and LIDAR on their cars and, there's been things going on that maybe has been behind the scenes. It's been being captured for a long time that I really do think over the next several years, we're going to see these platforms where you can, you can sit at home, put on a VR headset and log in and go to a virtual city 
and experience something that seems pretty realistic. Yeah. And I also think that we're going to see that hologram piece of like having a meeting in a room where you can turn on a display and have a virtual person there that uh, yeah. they're sitting in, in VR at their office, but they're, there's a digital piece of them in your, in your I location. See, I see that happening on the job site. Yep. Eventually. Totally. We're already experimenting with some tech that allows you to sort of join somebody on a walk. Yep. Virtually. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I completely agree with that. I think there's, really interesting possibilities when it comes to uh, creativity, right? You, so we're, if you talk about merging and taking like some of the real world and digitizing it, um, you know, from a design standpoint, what, what I really saw that was neat about Matterport, for example, like you mentioned, is now like I looked at it at first from a real estate standpoint. Yeah. It's like if I were a real estate agent, I would want to like buy one of those or yep. like, you know, do because I could, if I had 20 houses that I know are being sold, I could bring those to you as yep. a client, yep. right? And put you in them and now, <laughs> now like get a short list from 20 down yeah. to five. And now let's go see those in person. Yeah. Um, but now you talk about, you know, being able to sort of like, digitize and bring it into, you know, a different space and, and sort of put yourself in there. I imagine stuff like, you know, an owner wants to build a property and you could like designers could pre-make designs. Yep. And, you know, you could be like, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to build a spot. You want to build an office building here. Yep. And what if there's five, six designs that have already been done for, or like yeah. you could, you could bid that out in a way. Like there's all yep. kinds of different aspects yep. of like, okay, well I want, I want to, you know, I want to build an office building here, like put that out to the world. And then like in, you know, a couple weeks you have like a couple different designs that you can explore in the metaverse yeah. about what you're yep. wanting to do. And now you get to sort of choose a path and, and you don't have to go down an expensive path of like, know, doing a set of drawings or like, you know, mm -hmm. you can, you can be very conceptual with it, but it's, you can make better decisions because you can actually go into that space. Yeah. Right. You can, you yeah. can, the, you know, the next best thing of physically being in there when it would be done, like you can see it ahead of time. Yeah. Right. So I think that's really going to change stuff. Like you can, you can start to, you know, just like in that aspect, you can start to design something before it's yep. becoming, you know, become a thing. You can create a marketplace for, you know, folks to create those designs and, yeah. you know, sort of merge, like, I think it'll be interesting because it's sort of uh, a merger of the creativity of what happens in the gaming world with like what we do. Yeah. Right. So yep. I think it's, it, it'll be interesting to see how those worlds sort of collide. Yeah. And in some ways they are with like people using Unreal Engine and, yep. you know, different stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of great technology there totally. that can help us in AEC sort of um, distribute it and like consume it, if you will. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I think that's, it'd be really interesting. I think there's a lot of um, potential and that, that, that thing, you know, of the design and that, that's sort of where my head yep. went, you know. Um, put a little bit of thought into it, but I mean, there's, there's, yeah. it's going to be one of those things where it's just going to go yeah. like in all different directions. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, ah, I don't know how valuable this will be, but you have to really get creative mm -hmm. and like, okay, well, what if that's not a barrier? What if, yeah. this, you know, that or whatever is not a barrier. And so, yeah, it'll be really, really interesting. Some of the uses I see, um, that I think are going to be pretty big as far as metaverse, you know, what's something in, in society right now that's actually going to move away from physical into digital in, in the long term. I honestly think like a big part of shopping mm -hmm. and retail and like, we've already seen the piece of what's everybody like to do right now, open Amazon, pick something and have it dropped off at the door in two days, you know, but I think that it's going to get to the point that even physical stores, people are still going to Yeah, like 
a Walmart, a Target, uh, whatever, a car, going to look at cars, I think it's going to get to the point that a lot of those shopping experiences people build into a digital environment. Yeah. The, the models of those are so realistic that you can just put on your VR headset, you are in the shopping space, you can see your preferences. You know, there's been some videos out there of like examples of what people yeah. think it could turn into, but I think that's very realistic. Um, that instead of going to the car lot and looking at random places, like you just log in and look at the car digitally. Of course, there will be that last step of okay, I've I've narrowed it down to the one I want. I'll, I'll go right. test drive it and buy it now. Right. Um, or maybe not. There's already companies delivering cars to your yeah. door when you buy them, and you get like a test drive period. So. I think is Interesting. And that's, that's where I go to the barriers. It's like, well, they, I'm sure there was barriers, in, yeah. you know, risk wise, insurance wise, like whatever to getting that, getting that, you know, done the way it is now. So mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we hear, we hear, you know, and it hasn't gone real mainstream yet, but we drone delivery. Yeah. Right. So I, I really think a majority of shopping in the future is going to be you're digitally shopping. You you order it, it gets delivered by drone. Like, I think the future is going to be weird. Yeah. Um, but again, I see, I see our industry and these technologies being a huge piece of, you know, and there's the discussion too of like, do we like that it's going to go there? Right. Is there going to be negative aspects of people being in VR all the time? Or I think there's a lot to consider, but I do think a lot of it's going to move that direction. And a lot of it has to do with digitally mapping stuff first and having access points and coordinates and yeah. digital models and the ARP. So I just think that I think our industry doesn't see a lot of that in what people are talking about regarding meta metaverse, but I think that our industry has a lot to do with it. So I think these conversations are, yeah. they're fun to talk about at least seeing yeah. where, where some thoughts are because it, it takes people that are being innovative and have that mindset to kind of cross the two of these for it to actually become reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting one. It is. Um, all right. Let's see. One, one other question would be, so maybe circling back to existing tech stuff. Okay. Um, is there anything on the top of your mind that if, if you could solve a current problem or you know, wave your magic wand and make a certain process, um, whether it's whether it's a technical workflow, if it's, you know, the scans are automatically registered on site or the data files being smaller and easier to transfer or, you know, s scan to models being faster. Like, is there a certain area in current tech that you guys are using or, or see that if you could improve it quickly, is there, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind to you? the mind is getting getting folks in the environment like whatever the the data um like we've we've got to make it as easy to use as possible mm -hmm. um and so i would say like figuring out how to you know the other buzzword there we use is democratization like you know get get the eventually the folks doing the work will like, like it's not gonna be a specialized thing eventually. Yeah. So I think in order to accelerate more people adopting it, more people using it, like it can't be specialized. So I think the consumption of, of the data, like it needs to be, you know, either more integrated, easier, um, you know, there's, there's, there's tools that come to mind like Sintu and TrueView and all these things that yeah. like get the data two folks but yeah. there's still sort of like a meet in the middle yeah kind of thing um and so you know i think right now it's like get folks in there so that they can really understand like this is the real space yeah you know like you can you can you know virtually visit the real space if yep. we have this this capture yep um and i think along with that the other side is like having folks that aren't specialists you know, you, you mentioned some of the enabling technology of like field, you know, reg, real time registration, like all those kind of things. I think they're all already kind of down that down that route. Um, but if I had to pick like the thing, I think it would be just it, it's literally that entire workflow. Yeah. Right? It's like 
get it, make it easier for the entire team to use. Like if, if a PE can just, you know, run out there and walk out and it all just kind of like mm -hmm. captures the data and works, or if there's some way to, you know, sort of push a button and everything in the job is captured kind mm -hmm. of thing with a, a passive data capture concept or something mm -hmm. like that. I think we've, we've, we've got to get away from uh, the minutia and the complexity of getting the data and focus on the value of leveraging it. Um, so, like I said, the first thing to me is consuming it and, yeah. and understanding the, the value that people are going to get out of it. Like, you know, yep. getting them to understand, like, this is, this is what you get. And, you know, there's, it, there's a lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot you can take that, take that with. So, or, or do with that. You know, it's, I think the, the consumption being easier makes it, makes it spread to more users, right? Because, yeah, a lot of the processes are still very technical and take a, a certain expertise and training. And, and we see issues when we try to, uh, you know, make assumptions that it is easy, right? Like people who just It's the tricky part, right? So yeah. when you sell it, you want it to you want it to yeah. appear easy but not too easy because yeah. it's like, no, I really have to put some work into doing this yeah. to get it to the point that it makes it easy to use yep. or gets the value out of it. Yep. So that's yeah, that's the, the tricky side of it. Yep. So I think I think I think you're definitely right on there. And and like you mentioned, things like into and Navisworks and, you know, making ways that we can just say, here's the file, open it, here's something you can do with it, you know, gets that initial foot in the door. Once people start seeing the data and they're like, I can actually pan in this photo, <laughs> you know, it, this isn't just a picture. I can I measure. Can, I can spin around. Oh, and measure? And measure. Like, oh my yeah. gosh, this is yeah. crazy. You're like, yeah. And that's the most simple part of what we did. Right. Like, we also have that in a full 3D and you can slice a whole floor plan or create a section and look at the the floor and the ceiling and the you know all levels and it I think getting that foot in the door sometimes with with projects um, you know people on the site that haven't yet used the data it it really launches things forward with that user and that team yeah yeah it's like you could validate or, or take several measurements or you could capture the whole thing mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And that's that's kind of like the assumptions, you know, that we were we were tackling when we looked at the floor flatness stuff. Yep. You know, it's like the standards even say, well, you can't measure the whole every square inch. Like, well, what if you can? Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's that's where, you know, I start thinking about, well, what if this barrier is gone or what if that's mm -hmm. out of there? Or what if, uh, you know, everybody on the site is so, you know, well ingrained in using the model and the, and the reality captured data that you know, it's just second nature. Like yeah. What happens then? Like, you know, can, can a, can a job be safer? Can we get to like no incidents? Like, can it be, can I, can I, can we get to, can we use this technology to make the job site just as safe as the office? Yep. Like, I think that's possible. Uh, we're a long way from that, but like, that's yeah where we should be going. Right. Um, you know, how can we, how can we get this technology into other people's hands um, so that everybody can benefit, you know, all the way, all the way down to the, to the craft folks. Yeah. You know, that are, that are putting stuff in place, like should have some of the information depending, you know, whatever it is, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to, I tend to look big picture like that. Um, and just how, how I see it, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that's why you, uh, you've continued to, you know, increase your scope of, of focus, right? You know, there's a lot of people that kind of stay, um, they stay stuck into what they're hands on dealing with. And it takes certain personnel that have that bigger picture and, and want to, instead of hitting a barrier and saying, okay, well, this is all we can do. You know, we can, we can do this, we can deliver. Having that idea of, well, how do we get rid of the barrier? And how do we innovate even more? You know, that having that big picture is so important in driving within a big company and making that process seamless as well as just improving the industry as a whole. You know, even the the vendors, like all the people that are making the hardware and the software and the they need to hear from people like us that are doing that innovation and hitting the roadblocks yeah. in order for the 
technology to improve because they understand it enough to make it, but being the actual users working on the project, hitting roadblocks and figuring out how to get past them, giving the feedback of how we got past them is what can then help the hardware and the software say, okay, let's figure out how to take it to that point, work around this roadblock. So now the user doesn't have to do that work around. Yeah. It happens by itself. And I think that's where we see like the registration piece, right? Like we used to have to deal with all these targets. There was no cloud to cloud. It was, and now there's a cloud to cloud. Well, now we're like, okay, what if instead of taking it back to the office and doing cloud to cloud, it can be stitching itself on site. Now that's here. Right. What's next? So I love giving this feedback, having these conversations. That's why we do the podcast, right? Is because getting feedback from users, getting feedback from different industries, letting other industries hear our conversations, letting vendors hear the issues we've hit is what I think can drive the industry as a whole. Yeah. More yeah, conversations. I mean, that's, that's what I like about my current role is that a lot of it is bringing our partners and our vendors together and sort of being a connector for the folks that are on our projects, testing things out, using it in a real world scenario. And then part of my job is to bring them back to the vendor and say, well, what did you get out of that? You know, like what, what, what suggestions would you have? Like, how could we make this more integrated into our whole ecosystem? And so there's, there's definitely some, some influence and they're all hungry for feedback, right? Which is great. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to be able to, to bring folks that want to, folks that want to test things out and use it and get the value out of it and then say, okay, well, you know, we'll get more value if you build this in or, mm -hmm. you know, make this function this way. And so that's, that's, that's really fun. I like, I like that aspect of it because, you know, the, everybody's construction has so many challenges, right? It's so complex and everybody's, there's so many different problems to solve. So it's, it's really interesting to look at the tech space, the construction tech space and see the different perspectives that people have on the challenges that we have, if that yep. makes sense. So like, oh, well, you know, we know this is a problem, so we're gonna do it this way, right? We're gonna, or we're gonna combine these technologies or we're gonna, you know, have you do this workflow, you know, this way, clash detection and into VR and, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and then someone else looks at it completely differently and they're like, well, if you grab this information and that information, you know, and so it's like, but a lot of it, you know, it, it, I do see some of it starting to converge where it's like, yeah. um, a lot of people are tacking, tackling production tracking and mm -hmm. progress monitoring and all these kind of, kind of things, but doing it in different ways. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what's really exciting about like where things are at right now is that we're really starting to mature and what we can do with the information. Um, and you started to see different perspectives of how to solve our, our problems. Yeah. So. Thanks for coming in today. It's good stuff. Thank it you was, for having uh, me. It was great having you. I'm sure this won't be the last time we see you. I in fact, uh, <laughs> those listening are probably going to be able to expect to see you talk at our conference in October. I think that's probably going to be the plan. case. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to, we're going to have you back. We're excited about it. So thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.